Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Wednesday, November 1st edition of the Basement Academy. We are live again. If you missed it, no recording on Monday. I was trying to nurse this thin voice that you can still hear. Tuesday, yesterday, uh, went live, beginning an introduction to um, our new study, which I'm calling Reversed Thunder, theme from the book of Revelation, and I'm encouraging you to purchase this book by Eugene Peterson, entitled Reverse Thunder, The Revelation of John and the Praying Imagination. So I'll be, in fact, reading a little bit from, from this book today. So go ahead and get that. I'm trying to give you a couple days to, to catch up to that. I want to begin this morning with a psalm, one of the psalms that we prayed a couple weeks back when I was um, emceeing that event with the local Chabad um, synagogue, an evening of solidarity. We prayed Psalm 121, which calls to mind that God watches over Israel. And he, he neither slumbers nor sleeps. And so, so as God, we pray as watching, we know and trust as watching, over the events in the Middle East right now, so he watches over our lives. And so let, let's begin with Psalm 121 and pray this with awareness of world events as well as our own lives. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. Amen. Lord, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer for the peace of Jerusalem, and the peace of our own lives. Okay. Um, world events going on then, world events going on now that, that gather an interest in a book like uh, revelation. And so I'm going to take the approach of, of Peterson here, Eugene Peterson. I, I read this back in 1993. First read this book 30 years ago, so it's shaped my understanding of this last book of the Bible. Um, so really my entire ministry essentially has been shaped by by this um, framework. It's a, it's a framework of understanding. Eugene Peterson points out that the Apostle John writes this book as a person. Okay? The tendency is to come to the book of Revelation and see it as a book full of codes that we need to decipher. And there are plenty of people who are trying to do the deciphering predicting when, predicting where, predicting how things will unfold. Peterson suggests that this is a, a bit misguided. We come to it in, in kind of an um, impersonal or depersonalized way, and we ought not do that. That this book was written by a person, St. John, who wrote the Gospel of John, and three little letters, and we've been studying uh, some of those on Sunday mornings, as you know. Peterson points out that John writes in, in three ways. He writes as a theologian. He, is, he, he, he comes to be known in the, the tradition of the church as St. John the Divine or St. John the Theologian. His gospel is so very different. It's a theological reflection. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Very different opening to John's gospel than we get to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so John is understood as a theologian whose life is 
obsessed with, consumed by God. That's what theology really is. Theology proper is the study of God. And so John is interested in God. Not in writing a series of codes that we can unravel about world events someday. He's interested in writing a a book, a letter here, that has God as the, the, the main actor in the story. God is the hero. God is the protagonist. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we will, we will unpack that in this, in this letter. And so John writes as a theologian, he writes also as a poet. Peterson uh, makes the point here in his, in his book the, the, the word poet or the word poem comes from a word that at, it, at its root means maker. And so the, the poet is, is using words, combines words in such a way as to, as to kind of make an, a, a way into a, a new understanding of reality. Does it make a new reality? The poet makes reality possible to perceive in new ways. We only have reality, right? We only have the stuff of this life. And so John in this revelation presents to us the story with images and pictures and visions it, it's, it's graphic in the sense of there are dragons and there are um, the, the, these large candelabra, these lampstands, and there's angels and there's trumpets and there's bowls being poured out and there's um, a throne and 24 thrones around that throne and living creatures and thousands of angels. And so it's, it's full of images and, and so what poets do is they take the stuff of ordinary life, they, 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 they weave these words together. And, and words, as we know, often have more than one meaning. They, they have double meanings. They suggest, they hint, they, 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 they help us to ponder, they help us to see. <clears throat> and, and so um, this letter to or this essentially this this letter to the early churches peterson argues that it's a pastoral letter has over 500 allusions to other parts of the story for the scriptures as we know them and and so peterson writes that 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 john doesn't give us anything new here there's nothing new in the book of revelation which runs counter to the way many people think about this book. They think it's full of new information that we have to decipher somehow and figure out. No. John's just retelling the old, old story that anyone familiar with their Bible is going to recognize. And if, you're, if you've read your whole Bible, you're going to pick up on many of these allusions. We'll, we'll still miss some. But John takes the old materials and, and fashions them in a new way. And so what, what, what the poet is doing is trying to draw us in to awaken our imaginations. Most of us live this Christian life without a whole lot of fanfare, to be honest with you. If you've been at it for a while, and I'm assuming most of the folks, if not all of you in the Basement Academy, have been at this Christian life for a while. I've been at it 40 plus years. There's a sense of rhythm and routine that sets up Sunday mornings. We have our devotions. We go about our lives. We stumble. We fall. We pray for forgiveness. We come to the table. We celebrate baptisms. And then there are moments when God becomes very present and real to us, and then the routines return again. And so what Peterson is suggesting, John writes in a manner, he, he writes as a poet 
to awaken our imagination, to take the old story and help us to see it afresh for what it is. And so let me read, uh, this is in Peterson's introduction. It looks like it's Roman numeral 11, XI. That's the page number. I do not read the Revelation to get additional information about the life of faith in Christ. I have read it all before in law and prophet, in gospel and epistle. Everything in the Revelation can be found in the previous 65 books of the Bible. The Revelation adds nothing of substance to what we already know. The truth of the gospel is already complete, revealed in Jesus Christ. There is nothing new to say on the subject, but there is a new way to say it. I read the Revelation not to get more information, but to revive my imagination. The imagination is our way into the divine imagination, permitting us to see Holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, as whole and holy, H-O-L-Y. What we perceive is scattered as order, what we perceived as random. So, and so what Peterson's saying here is that the, the revelation gathers the 65 books into one story. We lose the plot sometimes. We lose the flow sometimes over 65 books. John is kind of capturing it all in in one book. St. John uses words the way poets do, recombining them in fresh ways so that old truth is freshly perceived. He takes truth that has been eroded uh, eroded to platitude by careless usage and sets it in motion before us in an animated and impassioned dance of ideas. Thank you, Eugene. And so John writes as a poet. And so when we get to the many images and dragons and beasts and all kinds of things, many of the numbers, we're going to read those poetically. We're not going to try to decipher some new code for some event that's going to happen out in the future. We're going to try to let those images work on us poetically to open our imagination, understanding the story that we already know, okay? And then finally, Peterson points out that John writes as a pastor. He is a pastor to these seven churches. We'll read the letters to those in chapters two and three. He, he writes as a pastor, Whatever else you think pastors are supposed to be doing, and and each of you have some idea of that, right? What pastors do is they accompany God's people in the ordinariness of their lives and in the ups and downs and the triumphs and tragedies of their lives. Pastors accompany a people and individuals, and families, and a community, pastors accompany in the midst of their own lives. And pastors are there, set among us, to remind us God is present. God is working. God is God. We are not. (laughs) It reminds us that there are enemies, Reminds us that there is a story that has a plot that is unfolding, that it's, it's not all disordered. And so pastors are those who accompany us along the way. And so John is a pastor to these churches. And so he's writing as one of the flock. He is one of the redeemed, right? But he writes as one who has an appointed task. And so this is what I, what, what Eric, what we do among you. We, we, we live among you, we laugh, we eat together, we, we, we gather, we catch up a little bit. You pray for me, I pray for you. We, we support and encourage one another. Then we stand and we re- remind you, God, 
<laughs> and we we say, let us pray, and we pray, and and, and we we read the scriptures and we, we say, let us give attention to God's holy word. We break bread, we we administer baptism. And so and so in the opening of the revelation, we hear that John is accompanying these churches in their hardship. And so I'm gonna skip to verse nine. This is chapter one, verse nine. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And so John writes, I, John, your brother. So he starts with that family filial relationship. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. I am one of you. <laughs> and, and I'm a companion in the suffering. And so this is in a time of persecution. He's on the island of Patmos, small penal colony, essentially, being sent there because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He has been proclaiming that Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. And that is a criminal offense in the ancient Roman Empire. And so he's writing from prison, as it were. And, and he knows that the churches, the seven churches to which he writes, that they're facing the same hardship. And so uh, I am a companion in the suffering and in the kingdom. So there's the pastor reminding you there's a kingdom and the patient endurance. We're going to get through this, team. That's what John's saying. We're going to get through this, and I'm there with you. I'm suffering, I, I can't be with you in, in body, but I'm writing this letter to these churches. And when it's read, you will understand that I'm with you. And so the, the book of Revelation speaks in every generation to people, God's people, who are, who are kind of caught or stuck in this life trying to live out the faith and for most of us, it's mostly humdrum days. I'm not saying that Jesus is humdrum, but the reality is most of us settle into some rhythms and routines over time, of which our faith in God and Christ is a piece of that, right? It's a significant piece. But we've got work, we've got family, we've got responsibilities, bills to pay, news to watch, you know, votes to cast, you know, all the stuff. But we also live our lives, every generation of, of Christians lives their lives in faith in the context of a world that is opposed to that faith. Even back in the day here in America, there were forces set against the faith, maybe not perceived as much because we sometimes become so cozy with the culture, we fail to be distinguished from it. In our day, it's easier to see. To be a Christian in, 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 in a public way is increasingly costly. Certainly in other parts of the world, to be a Christian, may, you may lose your life. Right? There's been a persecution going on for 2,000 years. And so, and so this, this, Peterson argues that this essentially is a pastoral prayer. It is a theological poem. He kind of alternates. That the letter really is about a pastor praying for instructing the churches that he has, for which he has responsibility. 
So the theological poem weaving all these strands of the story into one tightly knit story. So the theological poem to waken our understanding of what's going on. But it's it's a prayer. It's a pastoral prayer. It's 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 written to assure and to comfort and to encourage and to stimulate and to embolden God's people to press on the patient endurance, right? What, what, what John writes is the patient endurance. So, so let me stop there. Let me invite you, um, I'll, I'll remind you of this, uh, to, to get the book, Reverse Thunder. It'll take a day or two to come in if you're ordering it. But when you get it, read the first couple chapters, the introduction and then the, the, the chapter entitled Famous Last Words. Famous Last Words. That where, where Peterson unpacks this notion of theologian and, and poet and, and pastor. And then let me invite you to begin reading the book of Revelation itself. If you could read chapter one, that would be great. Uh, we'll, we'll dive in tomorrow as we start looking at the last word on scripture. Okay, it's a kind of an ominous way of talking about it. But anyway, let, let, let's close with prayer and then we'll pick up again tomorrow. Let's pray. And so Father, we thank you for your many gifts to us this new day mercies which are new that will be manifested in, in meals that we will take in sustenance, uh, conversations with family and friends, work to do. There may come some down moments or draw our hearts to, to prayer and, and to good reflection um, for the opportunities that come our way to serve our neighbors, the neighbors we have from you as we have sung recently. Lord, let us, let us do good and let us use this day uh, for, for all that you intend uh, for us to, to show ourselves as the followers of Jesus and where we meet the opposition, where we meet the resistance, where we meet the challenge. Lord, accompany us with your spirit and with reminder that you are with us always, even to the end of the age. And so here are our prayers as we make them now in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, may the Holy Spirit abide with you, rest upon you, and overflow from within you, that you may live this day wisely and well, bearing the fruit of that Spirit to God's glory. Amen and amen.